This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 91, for broadcast on the 29th of August, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, was there a second dinosaur-killing asteroid impact? Looking at the origins of the Martian moons Phobos and Deimos, and Artemis 1 on Final Countdown. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have discovered a massive asteroid impact crater in the North Atlantic Ocean, which may have formed at the same time as the infamous dinosaur-killing KT boundary event Chicxulub asteroid. The findings, reported in the journal Science Advances, suggest the possibility, at least, of a one-two knockout punch, with not one but two asteroids slamming into the Earth and wiping out most life on the planet. The newly found crater is located 400 kilometres off the coast of Guinea in West Africa. It's been named after the nearby Nadia Seamount, 100 kilometres to the south. The thing is, this 8.5 kilometre wide structure is being dated to the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary Period 66 million years ago. That's the same time frame as the infamous 180 kilometre wide Chicxulub impact crater which is located on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in the Gulf of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, and it suggests the two impactors may have had a common origin. The Chicxulub impactor was estimated to be around 10 kilometres wide, and its impact caused one of the greatest mass extinction events in Earth's history, killing some 75% of all life on the planet, including famously all the non-avian dinosaurs. The new study suggests this newly discovered crater was formed by a somewhat smaller asteroid, about 400 metres wide. Computer simulations suggest it would have produced a fireball with a radius of over 5 kilometres, instantly vaporising surrounding water and seabed sediment. The study's authors say the impact would have produced tsunami waves up to a kilometre high around the crater and shock waves from the impact would have generated magnitude 6.5 to magnitude 7 earthquakes, releasing around 5,000 megatons of energy. The impact crater was identified using seismic reflection as part of a project studying the tectonic breakup of South America from Africa during the Cretaceous. Seismic reflection works like an ultrasound, sending pressure waves through the ocean and its floor and detecting the reflected energy coming back. The data allows scientists to reconstruct the architecture of the rocks and sediment, providing a picture of what lies underneath. This is space time. Still to come, a close-up look at one of the biggest black hole jets ever seen, and a new study examines the possible origins of the Martian moons Phobos and Deimos. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Astronomers have been given the most detailed view yet of the structure of the spectacular jets that are generated by supermassive black holes as they feed. The new observations, reported in the monthly notice of the Royal Astronomical Society, are allowing researchers to see shock diamonds generated by the pressure of material in these superluminous jets interacting with the surrounding interstellar and intergalactic gas. The jets are being produced by a material which is being crushed, torn and ripped apart on the accretion disk surrounding the event horizon of a supermassive black hole at the heart of the elliptical galaxy NGC 2663. The shock diamond effect the astronomers are seeing is analogous to an effect seen in jet engines. As the exhaust plume of a jet or rocket engine blasts through the atmosphere, it's constricted from the sides by the ambient air pressure and this causes the jet to expand and contract, pulsating as it travels. Seeing the same pattern in the jets emanating from a black hole tells astronomers there's enough matter in the intergalactic medium surrounding NGC 2663 to constrict the jets. Now, in return, the jets are heating and pressurising this material. 
The galaxy NGC 2663 is located some 93 million light years away and contains about 10 times as many stars as our own galaxy, the Milky Way. The massive jets generated by the central black hole span almost a million light years, 50 times larger than the galaxy itself. In fact, if your eyes could see it in the night sky, it would cover an area larger than the full moon. The observations were made as part of the Evolutionary Map of the Universe, or EMU survey, using the CSIRO's Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, or ASCAP, radio telescope, located in the Murchison area of the Western Australian Outback. ASCAP is a network of 36 linked radio telescope dishes forming a single interferometer. One of the study's authors, Professor Ray Norris from the University of Western Sydney, says while astronomers have found these sorts of jets before, the immense size and relative nearness of this one makes this among the biggest known jets in the sky. So it's, it's a big elliptical galaxy, and it's got a supermassive black hole in the middle, which is not particularly unusual. And coming up to the black hole are these two great long jets. Now, the so all that is pretty normal. We see these things all over the sky. What's really interesting about this one is it's, it's a very active one. It's an enormous jet, and yet it's quite close to us. And so it gives us the opportunity really to study these jets in enormous detail. And that's what's really special about this one. These jets are so big, and it, and it amplifies close as well. If you could see the sky with radio eyes, this thing would be bigger than the moon which is actually enormous. Usually these things are tiny little specks in the sky, you know. So it is intrinsically a very large pair of jets squirting out of this black hole, but not the largest in the universe or anything, but quite large. But because it's very close, they look very, very large on the sky. Let's say we see these jets all over the sky, but we don't actually understand how they work very well. And that's the important thing about this source, is that we're seeing it with this beautiful detail. And so we're seeing diamonds, as you say, in the jets, which is just like sort of the shock diamonds that you see coming out of the backs of jet engines on planes. And in the case of planes, you understand what causes these. It's the material from the jet squirting out and the atmosphere around it is squeezing in and the jet pushes against it and the atmosphere wins a little bit and squashes a bit and the jet pushes back a bit, it goes out again. And so you get these diamond-shaped lumps. In, in the trail coming out of that jet engine. And we're seeing this in this source here. Now, this is the first time anybody's ever seen this. People have said that maybe you do see this somewhere, but it's the first time we've really seen a good picture of it. And because it's so close, we're able to really analyze these jets and look at the, mo uh, look at the magnetic field and the jets and so on and really understand that this is what's happening. Are these jets quasars? And if so, are they caused by the same thing as quasars? Yeah, so um, these are exactly the same jets that we've seen quasars, yeah. Um, quasars are those uh, jets which have to deploy more or less straight at you. Maybe I should explain how these jets are formed. So when you've got a supermassive black hole, like in this galaxy or the quasar, you've got all this gas falling in from outside the galaxy and falling into the black hole and getting hotter and hotter as it falls into the black hole. Now, people might say quite reasonably, hang on. Isn't it a one-way trip into a black hole? How come this stuff's working out? What actually happens is the uh, gas being sucked into the black hole gets so hot and so dense just before it hits the event horizon that you get this enormous pressure. It can't actually fall into the black hole fast enough. And so some of it actually gets squirted out in this region around the black hole, and it comes out the, the easiest place it can, which is the top and bottom of the accretion disk around the black hole. And, it, and it, so it's working out. And as it comes out, it's probably in a sort of conical shape. And that conical shape then gets bent into a, a gets collimated into a parallel stream. Part, we, we don't actually understand, understand the process completely, but it's something to do with mag magnetic fields coupled with the pressure from outside. So then you've got these two jets squirting out from around the black hole. And often in many galaxies, they just go off in space and they gradually scoop up material from around them. And they slow down a bit. And eventually you end up with these lovely lobes that you often see around these radio galaxies. Now, in this case, we're seeing a bit more complex stuff going on. That The jet 
does it squirt down? It's interacting with the material around it, and that material is squeezing the jet inwards, and the jet is resisting and pushing out. And then you can see this tussle going on between the jet and the material around it. And as, as the jet pushes out and the material outside pushes in, that's what gives you these bumps in the jet that in a jet engine would see as diamonds at the back of the jet. Now, this material is being heated to X-ray temperatures uh, as yep. it's through friction and uh, and just the the physics of being crushed and squeezed and torn apart on the accretion disk. And it, it's, it's then being pushed out by we think magnetic field forces generated by the massive black hole, and then it's being shot out at close to the speed of light in opposite directions, perpendicular to the creation disk. And as it's going through the interstellar medium, it's being affected by that, and that's what's causing these shock diamonds. That's right, yeah, yeah. It's that interaction with the medium around it which is causing these. This is telling us a lot about the intergalactic medium in which these jets are are passing through. Well, it is, but it's also telling us about the jets. Uh, and I mean, I'd love to say that it was like this paper uh, uh, by Stuart Valet Valovich has done a lot of hard work on this. I'd love to say that the work he's done has really shown us how these jets work. Unfortunately, that's not the case. What it's done is actually answered, asked more questions than it's answered. <laughs> and um, we can see these really complex interactions going on between the, the jet and the interstellar medium. Clearly, it's more than just the jet carving a hole through the interstellar medium, which is, I think, what we once thought. And there are these very complex interactions going on. Uh, there's lots of puzzles about these jets, lots of things we don't understand. Why are some of them different shapes, one brighter than the other? Um, why, why does a black hole sometimes have jets and sometimes doesn't? And there are all these questions. And what this work by Valibor has shown us is that, yeah, it's a lot more complex than that. When you look in detail, you can see the outside environment has a big effect on the jets. It's not just what the jet's doing. The outside environment has a big effect on it too. When we look at these jets, uh, are we seeing the sort of thing that, well, it's happening in our own galaxy through the Fermi bubbles, but uh, from a different angle? Yeah, it's it's related. So the black hole in our own galaxy is much smaller. It's only a million times the mass of the sun. Oh, nothing. Um, <laughs> whereas, whereas the one in this galaxy is probably a thousand times bigger than that. So the difference in scale the other thing is the black hole in our own galaxy isn't doing very much at the moment. And so those Fermi bubbles that you're talking about are really left over from a, a time when the black hole was probably more active. And, and we think that maybe sometime in the past, if we'd looked at that black hole in the galactic centre, we may have seen a jet coming out of it. Now, there isn't there one now. But things like the Fermi bubbles are telling us, yeah, this actually probably used to lot, be a lot more active and this is at the moment. And we know that in all galaxies, these the activity from these supermassive black holes tends to switch on and off with time. Maybe over 100,000 years or a million years, they switch on, on and off. And so in our own Milky Way, it's in a bit of a quiet phase at the moment. Clearly in this galaxy, NGC 2663, it's in a very, very active phase at the moment. But that's not to say that in a million years, it may be switched off and there'll just be this red dead elliptical galaxy and if we look very carefully we might see some fossil remnants of these jets and we see those in other galaxies too where to now well one of the things we need to do is find more of these objects right we've only got one and we need to understand what's special about this object or what's more general phenomenon that you, know, you see in all these jets if you study them hard enough now we have the fantastic telescope uh, that csi have just built the ASCAP radio telescope in west australia which is really good at surveying large areas of the sky and finding rare objects. And so we're now going through the ASCAP data and trying to find more. Well, we, we are finding more of these things. And so the next step is to get together a group of these so we've got more than, one, more than just one to study and see if we can understand the physics of this better. And that's where the EMU survey comes in. <laughs> that's exactly right. So the, the EMU survey, the evolutionary map of the universe, is the main big survey for doing this on the ASCAP telescope. So we've just got a, a couple of fields that we observed as a pilot, as part of the commissioning of the telescope. And I should say, actually, this work on NGC 263, I think we only had 26 antennas working at the time we did this. So this is in the early stages of ASCAP. We now have 36 going. So we did two pilot surveys, and then later this year, we're going to start this mammoth effort that's going to take about five years to study the whole sky like this. And we'll just find yeah, millions of these objects. We expect to find quite 
50 million radio sources. And all these things at the moment we regard as rare will probably have lots and lots of examples of each of them. So it's going to completely change the way we do radio astronomy, actually. And of course, it'll change even further as the Square Kilometre Array comes online. That's right. So in 10 years' time, we'll have the Square Kilometre Array, and that's going to go even deeper and have even higher resolution. That's going to be completely mind-boggling. That's Professor Ray Norris from the University of Western Sydney. And this is Space Time. Still to come, looking at the origins of the Martian moons Phobos and Deimos, and yet another delay for Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study has confirmed that the two Martian moons Phobos and Deimos were never a single body. The origin of the two moons has generated much speculation and debate. The larger of the pair, Phobos, is some 22.7 kilometres wide, while Deimos is just over half that size at 12.6 kilometres. The potato-shaped moons orbit the red planet very rapidly, with Phobos taking just 7 hours, 39 minutes and 12 seconds, while Deimos orbits a bit further out, taking 30 hours, 18 minutes and 43 seconds. Historically, astronomers have always leaned towards the idea that Phobos and Deimos are captured asteroids. This capture hypothesis has both objects originally part of the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, but eventually being affected by some gravitational perturbations and then captured by the red planet's gravity. An alternate impact hypothesis suggests that an impact has struck Mars, creating a debris ring around the red planet which eventually accreted to form two rubble pile moons. A new hypothesis presented last year proposed that Phobos and Deimos may have been the remains of a primordial moon that simply broke apart. That's based on orbital simulations showing that the pair's orbits would have crossed sometime between 1 and 2.8 billion years ago. According to this ring-moon recycling hypothesis, a single progenitor moon was ripped apart either by tidal forces after passing the Martian Roche limit or by an impact. The resulting debris then formed a ring around Mars, which eventually coalesced to form the two moons, Phobos and Deimos. The problem there is new three-body numerical simulations reported in the Planetary Science Journal show that the pair would have collided with each other within 100,000 years of breaking apart. And that would have left Mars with another debris ring, which would still be visible today. This is space time. Still to come. Another delay for Boeing's Starliner spacecraft and stunning new images of the King of Planets thanks to NASA's new James Webb Space Telescope. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The first manned test flight of Boeing's new CST-100 Starliner spacecraft has been delayed until at least early next year because of modifications needed following its last test flight back in May. The mission, carrying two astronauts to the International Space Station, was slated for December, but will now not take place until February at the earliest. Technicians say they need more time in order to address the issues identified during the unmanned orbital flight test too. These include thruster problems, which forced the spacecraft to undertake a second go-round before successfully docking with the orbiting outpost. Boeing engineers believe debris in the service module thruster system may have been to blame. The post-flight reviews have revealed four primary issues requiring additional work, as well as the premature shutdown of two of Starliner's orbital manoeuvring and attitude control thrusters, Starliner also experienced problems with the smaller reaction control system thrusters, both on the service module and on the capsule. There were also anomalous high-pressure readings in Starliner's thermal control system, and its vision-based electro-optical sensor tracking assembly, which aids in rendezvous and docking, didn't behave as expected, although it did perform its primary task. Orbital Flight Test 2 was Starliner's second attempt to undertake an unmanned test flight to the International Space Station after the first attempt failed due to a number of software issues. 
He's firstly placed the spacecraft into a low orbit, leaving it unable to reach the space station. And had the software issue not been found, it would also have seen the spacecraft destroyed during the program's separation of the command crew and service modules. If NASA approves the latest modifications, Starliner will be stacked on top of its Atlas V launch vehicle in November. The eight-day test flight would carry two astronauts to the space station and back to Earth again, marking the final test before NASA can certify Starliner for routine crew transfer missions. Once certified, Starliner would join rival SpaceX's Dragon capsule, providing commercial crew transport services for NASA to the space station. But while Boeing struggles to get its ailing Starliner up to speed, SpaceX, which was certified back in 2020, is already preparing for its sixth manned flight to the space station. This is space time. Still to come, the king of planets seen in stunning new detail, and in part two of this week's show, Artemis 1 on its final countdown. All that and more still to come on space time. The latest images coming out of NASA's new James Webb Space Telescope are continuing to amaze astronomers. The stunning images include a new view of Jupiter, the solar system's largest planet. The infrared images, which are artificially coloured to make specific features stand out, show fine filigree along the edges of the coloured bands and around the Great Red Spot. They also provide unprecedented views of the gas giant's auroral activity over both the Jovian North and South Poles. One wide-field image presents a unique lineup of the planet, its rings, and two of its smaller moons, and will see an address tier against a background of galaxies. The two tiny moons are just 220 kilometers across respectively, and Jupiter's dark ring system is a million times fainter than the planet itself. Yet the features all stand out brilliantly. The study's lead author, Imke DePata, from the University of California, Berkeley, says astronomers have never seen such incredible images of Jupiter before. As well as its enormous anti-cyclone, the Great Red Spot, numerous storm systems can be seen as small pallid ovals. Also clearly visible are tiny bright plumes of cloud particles, as well as bright waves, swirls and vortexes. The transition between organised zonal flows and the chaotic vortex patterns at higher latitudes is also clearly visible. Although astronomers have seen many of these features on Jupiter before, James Webb's infrared wavelengths provides them with a very new perspective. In fact, the combination of images and spectra at near and mid-infrared wavelengths will allow scientists to study the interplay of dynamics, chemistry and temperature structure in and above the Great Red Spot and the auroral regions. This is space time. The final countdown underway for the Artemis I mission to the Moon, the Uni of New South Wales M2 spacecraft send back their first happy snaps from orbit, and China launches another group of spy satellites. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Up to 200,000 spectators have crowded parks and beaches around Cape Canaveral in Florida as the final countdown continues to the launch of the world's most powerful rocket. The SLS Artemis I moon rocket is towering above Space Launch Complex 39B at the Kennedy Space Center with all systems go. NASA have three launch windows open for this flight, which will send an unmanned Orion spacecraft on a 42-day mission beyond the moon and back. The first two-hour launch window opens today. Another one will open on Friday, September the 2nd, and the third next Monday, September 5th. The name Artemis is derived from the Greek goddess of the moon, who is the twin sister of Apollo, whose namesake program took humans to the moon for the first time back in the late 1960s and early 70s. 
When it finally lifts off on its maiden flight, the core stage of the 98-metre-tall SLS or Space Launch System moon rocket will produce some 8.8 million pounds of thrust from its four RS-25 Space Shuttle main engines and its twin strap-on solid rocket boosters. By comparison, the five massive F-1 engines from the Saturn V moon rocket, which took the first humans to the moon under the Apollo program, blasted out a total of 7.6 million pounds of thrust. Artemis I will be the first of a series of missions designed to return people to the moon, which was last visited by humans 50 years ago with the crew of Apollo 17 back in 1972. The mission will travel more than 2 million kilometres, taking the Orion spacecraft some 65,000 kilometres beyond the moon and further than any other human-rated spacecraft has ever travelled. After several orbits around the moon and the deployment of 10 scientific and research satellites, Orion will head back to Earth, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at some 40,000 kilometres per hour. That's faster than any other human-rated spacecraft ever. During its descent, Orion's ablative heat shield will reach temperatures of over 2,700 degrees Celsius. The primary goal of this mission is to test all the technology of the SLS launch vehicle and Orion spacecraft to ensure they can reliably support human spaceflight. But for this mission, the only passengers on board Orion will be three mannequins that are being used to help measure radiation levels aboard the spacecraft as it travels through the Van Allen radiation belts and gets exposed to the solar wind and cosmic rays from the sun and deep space. One of the other key goals of Artemis is to establish an infrastructure in space on and around the moon that will allow for longer missions. The 10 CubeSats loaded onto Artemis 1 include the 14-kilogram Lunar Ice Cube 6-unit CubeSat, which will use a broadband infrared compact high-resolution exploration spectrometer to search for water resources from lunar orbit. Meanwhile, the Arizona State University's Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper will use a neutron detector to map hydrogen sources around the lunar south pole. Lockheed Martin's Loon IR will map the lunar surface to aid in selecting future landing sites on the moon. Japan's lunar lander Omotenashi will use airbags to touch down onto the moon's surface. Once on the ground, it'll measure lunar surface radiation and investigate soil mechanics using accelerometers. Looking at radiation from a different perspective will be BioSentinel, It'll deploy into a lunar flyby trajectory in a heliocentric orbit to study the effects of radiation on yeast organisms under deep space conditions. The Italian space agency's Argo Moon CubeSat will monitor and observe the upper stage of the SLS rocket after it's jettisoned by Orion. This will allow it to monitor all the other CubeSats as they're being launched. But not all the CubeSats aboard Artemis 1 are targeting the Moon. The NEO Scout will be deployed on a two-year mission using a solar cell to manoeuvre towards any near-Earth asteroids it comes across in order to study them at close range using an image sensor. The Japanese space agency's Aqualis CubeSat will study the radiation environment in Earth's plasmosphere. This is the inner region of the Earth's magnetosphere. And the mission provides a unique opportunity to look at it from the outside rather than from within. Another CubeSat will be the CUSP mission. It'll be placed into an orbit around the Sun and use a suprathermal ion spectrograph to detect low-energy solar energetic particles, a miniaturized electron and proton telescope to count high-energy solar particles, and a vector helium magnetometer to monitor the strength and direction of magnetic fields. The Team Miles CubeSat will use innovative plasma iodine thrusters, which utilize low-frequency electromagnetic waves as propulsion, to travel around 60 million kilometers from the Earth on a journey towards Mars. Now, if all goes well with the Artemis 1 mission, the first manned mission of Orion will be Artemis 2, possibly launching in May 2024. It'll take a crew of four on a 21-day mission, which will fly by the Moon at an altitude of 7,400 kilometers. The mission's profile will be a multi-translunar injection with multiple departure burns and a free return trajectory from the Moon. That mission will also deploy a flotilla of CubeSats in support of the next mission, Artemis III, which will see humans return to the lunar surface, possibly in 2025. It would be the first manned flight to the lunar surface since Apollo 17 back in 1972, more than half a century ago. 
Once in lunar orbit, the Artemis III Orion capsule will dock with a pre-positioned SpaceX Starship HLS lander. Two of the Orion crew members will then transfer to the lander and travel down to the lunar surface, touching down near the South Pole for a week-long stay, undertaking scientific observations and collecting samples. Much of their equipment, including supplies and a lunar rover, will be pre-positioned before they arrive. Future Artemis missions will use the Lunar Gateway Space Station as a staging post and jumping off point before descending down to the lunar surface. The skills learnt during the Artemis program and the infrastructure built for it will then be used to take humans to the planet Mars, possibly sometime in the late 2030s. This report from NASA TV. NASA is preparing for a journey back to the moon. And after that, we're setting our sights on Mars. To get there, we need tons of rocket power coming from our space launch system. When it comes to how much power this thing can push out, this thing is massive. It's going to be mesmerizing to stand next to this massive vehicle. The immensity of it, knowing that this thing is going to be propelling a rocket into space and around the moon. Hang on, it's probably best to start back at the beginning. It all started in Promontory, Utah, where Northrop Grumman manufactured each of the segments that make up the rocket's boosters. After a 10-day cross-country journey, the booster segments were delivered to Kennedy Space Center's Rotation, Processing, and Surge Facility, or RPSF. If this all sounds familiar, that's because it's the same facility that was used to process shuttle booster segments, which all came from Utah. Then they're ready to go to the iconic Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB, where the rest of the motor segments are assembled and stacked on top of the mobile launcher. So the one thing about uh, this vehicle, of course, it's produced all across the country. Components all come here. They may be built around the country, but uh, they all come together right here in the Vehicle Assembly Building. Our SLS rocket will generate 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust to break through Earth's gravitational pull. That's more power than the space shuttle and the Saturn V rocket used. Teams with NASA's exploration ground systems are responsible for assembling the boosters that will house the majority of that power. The twin solid rocket boosters, made up of 10 total motor segments, will stand nearly 17 stories when fully stacked. First, teams will inspect and prep the hardware. Next, they're ready to start stacking the segments, a process that takes time, patience, and a steady hand. Once we have everything done in high bay four, we pick up the segment with the 325 crane, pick it up over the 16th floor crossover to where you see it now. Um, and we begin stacking the segments. Each segment, we lift over the 16th floor crossover and stack it. Once we stack it, we put it on top of the segment below and we, we put about 177 pins all the way around the whole thing to attach each segment. And the pressure to perform the operation flawlessly can test the team's nerves. There's a tremendous responsibility involved with processing flight hardware like this. It's, uh, it's, it's nerve wracking at times, but it's exciting. It's, uh, there's, there's zero appetite for risk in a program like this. We have a bunch of shuttle guys that are here to, to show us along the way, you know, if we get stuck, they're there to guide us. At the beginning of the stacking, it was, it was very nerve wracking, you know. With each segment that we stacked, a little bit of the nerve comes off. By the third or fourth one, it's, it's easy peasy, you know. We're pushing through, all the jitters are gone, and we're just excited to, to get finished with it. With all 10 booster segments now fully stacked on the mobile launcher, there's just one final piece of the puzzle to round out the power needed to get SLS off the ground and send it to space. Core stage. After a 900-mile journey aboard NASA's Pegasus barge, the SLS core stage, the largest rocket stage NASA has ever built, has made it to Kennedy Space Center. Today is a huge day. This is the last piece of big hardware that we need for Artemis One processing. And we've just been waiting a long time for this, this part of the vehicle to arrive so that we can get going on the next steps of our stacking operations. Standing an impressive 212 feet tall 
and weighing a whopping 188,000 pounds, the core stage came all the way from Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. The core stage went through round after round of rigorous testing, including what's called its Green Run series, truly putting its performance to the test. The series involved eight rounds that looked at systems individually before culminating in pure power. With over 700,000 gallons of propellant flowing through the core stage and its RS-25 engines firing for eight minutes straight, the successful final test resulted in some big emotions from the team. We cried, we laughed, and we cheered because it was uh, so emotional to see you know, the years of culmination coming through. And that victory did not come without overcoming a few challenges, proving why at NASA we test as frequently and as hard as we do. And we got to shut down. The all personnel. So we actually did a, a one-minute test on the first hot fire test, um, and then we learned a lot from that. Uh, we, we understood the vehicle more, we made a few changes, um, and then uh, we got back into our second hot fire test. There was a lot of uh, uh, joy and workmanship and ownership of being able to work that process and be able to get it done. When we went for the second hot fire, and we went for 500 seconds, that was just pure exhilaration. Following its arrival at Kennedy, teams moved the core stage into the VAB, where it was lifted by a crane and placed in between the twin solid rocket boosters. Serving as the backbone of the rocket, the core stage will provide more than two million pounds of thrust to help send the Orion spacecraft on its trip around the moon. Essentially, we have these two massive cranes that are located inside of the VAB, where we go ahead and we pick two points at the end of the core stage, one on the back portion of it and on the front portion of it. We lift it up to the point where we're able to transition it from a horizontal position over into a vertical position, and then essentially bring it way up to the top of the vehicle assembly building and cross it over into high bay three, in which we ensure that we don't damage any part of the vehicle as it's incoming into its position. NASA's largest rocket stage, now fully integrated with the twin boosters, is ready to get Orion off the Earth. But it will take one more critical component to give the capsule that extra push it needs to journey tens of thousands of miles beyond the moon. With just a single RL-10 engine, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, will provide over 20,000 pounds of thrust to send Orion on the ride of a lifetime. To connect the ICPS with the rocket stack, teams next added the launch vehicle stage adapter to the core stage, followed by the ICPS. The ICPS is the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, and essentially it's somewhat of the upper stage of the entire SLS vehicle. And what that will do is propel the Orion capsule along with its service module over to its destination, which at this point in time will be the moon. But before the spacecraft can be attached to the rocket, teams will conduct a series of tests to ensure all of SLS's components communicate properly with one another, plus the ground systems equipment, the launch control systems, and its software. Adding to the challenge, those methods for testing have changed significantly since the days of the Apollo program. Initially built in the 1960s to house assembly of the Saturn V, the VAB has undergone some major modifications to support several different kinds of rockets and spacecraft, whether they're going into low Earth orbit or venturing to deep space. This high bay was uh, shuttle heritage. Uh, before that, it was Apollo heritage. So uh, there's upgrades that are still occurring today to include uh, upgrades that will support Artemis II and Artemis III. When SLS blasts off from Kennedy's launch pad 39B, Orion isn't the only thing it will be sending to space. Hitching a ride with Orion are tiny shoebox-sized satellites called CubeSats that were loaded into the Orion stage adapter in Kennedy's space station processing facility. 
the extra room in the stage adapter provides a rare opportunity to send those CubeSats to deep space to conduct science and research of their own. And these CubeSats are on tap to study a range of topics, from the moon to asteroids to the effect of space radiation on living organisms. At this point, the stack is nearly complete. All that's missing is the spacecraft itself, which has been in the launch abort system facility, getting outfitted with one of the spacecraft's most crucial pieces. The launch abort system is kind of that pointy solid rocket motor that's at the top of Orion, and it's there to protect the crew in the event of an emergency, so it's a very important system. Fully integrated with its launch abort system, the Orion spacecraft slowly makes its way to the VAB in the overnight hours. Upon its arrival, teams carefully lift and lower it onto the Orion stage adapter. With this operation, stacking the most powerful rocket the world has ever seen is complete. We're trying to decide what does exploration look like in the future when we retire shuttle? You know, what does our nation want to do? Where do we want to go? How do we want to explore? To see it go from those days of words and ideas in people's heads to the three programs we have today and the Artemis mission and all the hardware that's been produced in, in factories ranging from big aerospace companies to little mom and pop shops all over the country and the world, it's unbelievable and I'm just really proud. Before SLS and Orion can launch into a new era of space exploration, a series of tests needs to take place inside the VAB validating the rocket and spacecraft as an integrated system and paving the way for one final milestone, wet dress rehearsal, allowing the launch team to run through a full launch countdown, but stopping just short of firing the engines. So proud when it rolls out of the VAB. I will personally be probably crying a little bit because it's such a big event. We worked so hard to get us to the day of rolling out. I'm probably going to be bawling when we launch it. <laughs> See it through my tears uh, because it's just a culmination of so much work uh, from everybody. We owe the advancement of science and research and technology to what we're doing here. And this is, this is a big opportunity for uh, us as a nation to reclaim our spot at the forefront of human space flight and uh, exploration. Artemis is going to be a major part of history. Uh, it most definitely is going to uh, rock the space industry when it flies. This program is going to go to the moon. It's going to go to Mars. We need that. This country needs that. This world needs that. I'm so excited. It's going to be a lot of work, a lot of work ahead of us, but the Artemis 1 is going to surprise everybody. And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from Jacobs Mechanical and Structures mechanic Timothy Merrick, Jacobs Artemis Area Integrator Tony Dees, EGS Quality Assurance Engineer Corbin Nappy, NASA Exploration Ground Systems Operations Flow Manager Lily Villareal, NASA Manager SLS Program Stages Office Julie Bassler, Aerojet Rocket Arm Lead RS-25 Integration Engineer Bill Muddle, NASA Exploration Ground Systems Integration Engineer Abdul Santos Galindo, and NASA Orion Program Production Operations Manager Scott Wilson. This is Space Time. Still to come, the University of New South Wales M2 spacecraft send back their first happy snaps, and China launches another group of spy satellites. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The University of New South Wales M2 satellites have sent back their first high-resolution remote sensing images. The university's space director, Professor Russell Boyce, has described the capture as an important step towards a sovereign space capability. Each M2 spacecraft is a six-unit CubeSat equipped with a variety of specially developed sensors and optical telescopes designed to gather data of a wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum to undertake multi-role missions using a highly adaptable and sophisticated onboard artificial intelligence system. 
The spacecraft's significant onboard processing capabilities are based around a versatile and rugged computer known as Volk, which is equipped with CPUs, FPGAs and GPUs, allowing its spacecraft to be completely reconfigurable for a wide range of missions, including aircraft and maritime surveillance, remote sensing, space environment research, communications, urban planning, environmental management, disaster response and national security. The M2 pair fly in formation using a Star Tracker navigation system and inter-satellite communications links. Their extremely low Earth orbit even allows them to employ aerodynamic forces generated by the rarefied atmosphere to help control their flight paths. The M2 spacecraft are the third mission under a joint Australian Air Force and University of New South Wales program and follow the earlier launch of the M1 and M2 Pathfinder missions. The Vault computer system used aboard the M2s are also incorporated into the CSIRO's CISAT-1 spacecraft. Less than a month after its last launch of spy satellites, Beijing has sent another trio of Yogang-35 military surveillance and reconnaissance satellites into orbit. The spacecraft were launched aboard a Long March 2D rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Centre in Sichuan Province. They were placed into a 500km high orbit. Beijing described the spacecraft as being intended for commercial remote sensing services for land resource investigation, natural disaster monitoring, urban planning, agricultural crop monitoring and public safety. In reality, they're operated by the Chinese military to provide continuous high-resolution and electronic monitoring of areas of interest to Beijing as part of what Xi Jinping describes as preparations for war. This mission came just days after China launched a Long March 4B rocket from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Jiangxi province, carrying three more satellites also designed to keep an eye on the Earth below. Beijing claims the primary payload was a terrestrial ecosystem carbon monitoring satellite, which will also be used for surveying and monitoring terrestrial ecology and resources, mapping, meteorology, agriculture, crop yields, disaster reduction and public safety. The other satellites launched on the mission includes one that collects information on global shipping navigation and flight status of aircraft, and a third which is allegedly carrying out space science and engineering research. The launch was followed just a few days later by the flight of the Series 1Y3 rocket from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China, carrying three more remote sensing satellites into orbit. And two weeks later, a Kuai Zhu-1A rocket was launched from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center, carrying the top-secret Chuanjing-16 experimental satellite into orbit. No details on that mission have been released. China now has an estimated 531 satellites orbiting the Earth, and since 2016, Beijing has launched more than 212 Earth observation, surveillance or reconnaissance satellites. Cosmonauts aboard the International Space Station were forced to cut short a planned six-and-a-half-hour spacewalk after one of their spacesuits suddenly failed. Russian mission managers say battery voltages suddenly dropped in the spacesuit for no apparent reason two hours into the EVA. The cosmonauts were installing cameras on the European Space Agency's new 11-metre robotic arm when the problem developed. Mission managers at Star City ordered the cosmonaut to immediately return to the airlock and hook up to the space station's umbilical power source. The hatch remained open as his spacewalking companion tied it up outside for another hour or so before also returning. Of course, NASA spacewalks have been on hold for a number of months now, ever since water began seeping into a German spacewalker's helmet during an EVA back in March. Now, it wasn't as bad as the 2013 incident when an Italian spacewalker almost drowned after water from the cooling system in his spacesuit suddenly began leaking. The American spacesuit that malfunctioned in March is being returned to Earth this week aboard a SpaceX Dragon capsule for further investigation. This is space time. Still to come, the science report. Meteorologists predict a 70% chance of a third consecutive La Nina. And a new study shows that dogs love their owners so much, they actually cry with joy when they see them. All that and more coming up on Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. 
The Australian Bureau of Meteorology has declared a La Nina alert, suggesting a 70% chance for the formation of a third consecutive La Nina year. The El Nino-La Nina Southern Oscillation Pattern, known as ENSO, is the primary meteorological driver influencing Australia's weather and climate on a year-to-year basis. It's a naturally occurring shift in ocean temperatures and weather patterns along the equatorial Pacific, causing a shift in atmospheric circulation. Now, La Ninas result in increased rainfall and flooding across eastern and central Australia, with more storm and tropical cyclone activity likely. There's also a weakening or even reversal of the prevailing trade winds, pushing more warm water towards Australia. And the colder eastern Pacific waters push the jet stream northwards, bringing more drought conditions to the southern United States and heavy rains and flooding to the Pacific Northwest and Canada. During a La Nina, U.S. winter temperatures tend to be warmer than normal in the south and cooler than normal in the north. La Ninas also tend to lead to more severe American hurricane seasons. A small study of 119 COVID-19 patients reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association suggests that as many as 1 in 40 still can't smell two years after infection. That equates to about 2.5% of patients whose symptoms were unchanged or had become worse. The study also found that 88.2% of patients said their senses were back to normal after two years, while 10.9% took more than six months to get their senses back. Now, in a separate study, scientists found that 27% still had at least one COVID-19 symptom after two years. The most common, other than a lack of taste and smell, was fatigue, which affected around 18.5% of patients. So far, over 6.5 million people have been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus. However, the World Health Organization says the true death toll is likely to be more than 15 million, with over 600 million confirmed cases globally. Well, first there was coronavirus, then came monkeypox. Now there's the tomato virus. More than 82 children in India under the age of 5 are reported to be infected with this strange new virus, which they're calling tomato flu. The disease got its name on the basis of the eruption of red and painful grape-like blisters throughout the body that gradually enlarge to the size of a tomato and turn red. Scientists are still trying to determine exactly what the virus is, but they know its symptoms are similar to dengue fever. The good news is this disease is generally mild, lasting 7 to 10 days, with symptoms including fever, rashes, some mouth sores and some joint pain. But the virus can spread rapidly and it can be transmitted on unwashed hands, surfaces contaminated with feces and through droplets from sneezing and coughing. The other important point is you can't catch tomato virus by eating tomatoes. A new study warns that Australia's abundant food supplies could be at risk from climate change and extreme weather events. The findings reported in the journal Nature are based on computer modelling used to investigate the effects of global warming on Australian agricultural supplies. Researchers found fruit, veggie and livestock sectors are the most likely to be affected, with those effects then flowing on to other non-food production sectors such as transport services. Scientists found disasters resulting from climate change and extreme weather events adversely impact crop and livestock production directly, but indirect supply chain spillovers have remained unclear, at least until now. The authors estimate that spillovers in terms of social impacts, such as the loss of jobs and income, as well as health impacts, will cascade across regions and sectors. They found that rural and remote communities are likely to be the hardest hit as climate change accelerates. Meanwhile, a separate report in the journal PLOS One has found that Australia's daily maximum temperature is warming, on average by about 0.21 degrees Celsius per decade. And the minimum temperature is also going up by about 0.13 degrees Celsius. The findings are based on climate trends between 1910 and 2013 using 72 Weather Bureau monitoring stations across the country. So overall, the nation appears to be experiencing warming in daily maximum temperatures, except for a small area of far north Queensland, where it's already hot. In general, New South Wales, southern Queensland and Tasmania experience the most significant warming in daily maximum temperatures compared to other regions. Victoria, Tasmania and southern Western Australia have also seen increasing numbers of extremely cold days.
Now, these findings support another study, this one in the journal Communications, Earth and Environment, which found that by 2021, the tropics, including northern parts of Australia, could experience dangerously high heat levels most days of the year, while the more southern parts of Australia are predicted to have deadly heat waves every year. Meanwhile, a fourth study, this one reported in the journal One Earth, says the gap between high wheat production nations like Australia and low wheat producing countries is set to widen under 2 degrees Celsius global warming with an increasing number of countries forced to rely on imports. The authors model the impact of warming and increased extreme climate events on wheat supply around the world, including increased fertilisation from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They found the changes mean high wheat yield countries like Australia are predicted to increase their yield, while less productive nations will decrease. The researchers say this means much of the world is going to be more reliant on imports. That means Australia will likely see an increase in income generated by wheat, while other countries will see higher economic stress. Well, if you've ever wondered why dogs are man's best friend, wonder no more. A new study reported in the journal Current Biology has found that your dog loves you so much, he or she literally cries with joy when they see you. Researchers found dogs' eyes can well up with tears when they're happy. After noticing his own dog had tears in her eyes while nursing her puppies, a Japanese researcher wondered if this was associated with happiness. So scientists recruited a bunch of dogs and measured the volume of tears in their eyes before and after reuniting them with their favourite human or when introducing them to a stranger. They say the dogs had more tears when being reunited with a loved one but not when meeting a stranger, suggesting that while tears don't fall from their eyes like human tears, they really do cry with happiness when they see their human companion. As for cats, well, they love you too, but they still want to know what's in your shopping bag first. Electromagnetic energy audits by ACMA, the Australian Media and Communications Authority, have confirmed that radiation emissions from cell phone towers are well within safety guidelines. The findings confirm there is no ionising radiation coming from the 5G network, or the earlier 4G and 3G networks for that matter. With the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex Sahara of Reut from ity.com. There's been concern about Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and uh, there were concerns about, I think, all the different generations of mobile technology. There were claims that uh, AirPods and wireless headphones could give you brain cancer. But it looks as though all of those claims have always been sort of overblown and only really uh, helped the people who were sort of interested in uh, tinfoil or aluminium-lined hats. The Australian Mobile Telecommunications Association, which is funded by the telcos, has put out a release pointing to the Australian Media and Communications Authority, government department, who have the electromagnetic energy audits. And they say that these again confirm that the EME, or electromagnetic energy levels from mobile base stations with 5G enabled, are very low. Now, the report actually notes that the audit found the average EME levels from all technologies, including 3G, 4G, and 5G, which are the bands that are still in, or the frequencies that are still in use, generations that are still in use in Australia, across 129 base stations was less less than 1.2% of the public safety limits, and most sites are actually under 1%. And uh, the ACMA audit also compared the measured values to those reported by the carriers in what's known as the Arpanza Environmental EME report prepared for all the mobile base stations sites across Australia. And in all cases, the measured values from the ACMA audit were below the carrier's predictions. So look, this is not going to convince anybody that believes that 5G is dangerous and it's sent by aliens to kill humans or and that the vaccine had microchips 5 5G chips that would change our lives or infect our brains or do crazy stuff, they're probably going to keep on believing whatever they're believing. But the reports from official government sources that are measuring this, presumably with very precise measurement equipment, are showing that the limits are 1% of the public safety level, so they're extremely low. And, um, you know, if there was something wrong with mobile phone technology, there'd be this litany of everybody would have brain cancer. And that's just not the case. I mean, sure, there are cases of people getting cancer all the time, every day, but there's not an overwhelming number that uh, would obviously cause huge alarm and concern. I mean, I've been using mobile technologies for you know, 20 years. Most people have, and most people are just fine. They just get on with life. Whatever aging they go through is just the normal aging of living a modern life. Is there a way that the public can check this data out for themselves? Sure. Well, there is an EME checker for from ACMA, if you just go to acma.gov.au, it's on the front page, and you can check the mobile phone tower emissions near you. Now, this, I guess, is just simply a reporting of the readings that they themselves have already uh, you know, taken. But if you are curious to see 
you know, what the uh, levels are from mobile towers that you see as you drive around or near your house or, you know, it's above some uh, apartment blocks, for example, then uh, this site lets you do just that. And, uh, you know, they've got a data quality statement. They explain the methodology. So, um, you know, definitely if you would like to know more, then go to ACMA, A-C-M-A dot gov dot A-U and uh, check out their electromagnetic energy checker site. That's Alex of Royd from ITY.com. The poor standard of today's journalism has once again been highlighted with reporters on one of Australia's leading TV networks treating a so-called psychic as the real deal, never questioning her claimed or more accurately imagined abilities. It was a clear case of not letting the facts get in the way of a good story. And it's a growing problem in journalism with personal opinion rather than facts dominating the day's news. But according to Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics, it's really not a new problem. This was a particular article that appeared on a, uh, I think it was a TV show actually, and associated website, which was an interview with a psychic who says she arms herself with a wand crafted from unique healing crystals and a sacred spray she makes herself and nicknames Holy Water, a delicate mix of prayers and energy from crystals. Using these tools, she says she bombards the demon and it implodes away from the physical. It should actually explode away from the physical, but never mind. And so basically, yeah, this is, if I can be blunt, rubbish. <laughs> it's very unskeptical of me to say, well, let's look into it. No, no, I'm not with this one. But of course, this is a, it's an out and out promotion of a psychic and exorcist by a particular sort of Sydney-based media outlet. And that's part of the problem that uh, we find in, in, in the skeptics. You're talking to journalists, and a lot of them don't do very good journalism. And whenever they say Mary Bloggs is a psychic, they should put the psychic in quotes, or it should actually be a self-professed psychic. Just saying they are a psychic says that psychic powers are real. We don't know that they are. So this particular person that has these special abilities, she can see dead people. She has from a very young age. She didn't like it, blah, blah, blah. But now she's helping people, getting in touch with the people across the way and clearing out demons, haunted houses, exorcisms. She, she's got a very broad range of, uh, of skills. But it's as much the media coverage of this which really uh, annoys the sceptics because it is so blatantly promotional without any sense of journalistic restraint in it. It's just straight out, this is the person to go to. We've named the names and this is all the, all the, the uh, facilities, all the practices she can do. Go see her. It's and, great uh, clickbait. You're going to be sucked in by the clickbait, and this is great clickbait. It is. It, it, it's clickbait of the worst sort. As I said, this one thing is actually especially problem, problematic, this particular story, because it says psychic reveals why hospitals are the most haunted places. And there's nary a mention of hospitals in this thing. So for a start, the clickbait is there in the headline. This is a psychic, stated as fact reveals why hospitals are the most haunted places, saying that hauntings exist, therefore, and that hospitals are are particularly haunted. And there's nothing in the story to say that. It is just a list of sort of claims by this person that is just sort of relayed totally uncritically. Is journalism becoming a uh, a fake news paradise these days? I mean, we're seeing it in politics. Is it just becoming the norm now instead of on the fringes? I think there's always been journalism, which is lazy journalism, right? Take a press release, don't question too much. I've got to write four stories today. I really can't spend a lot of time researching, etc. So I'm just going to call up one person. Uh, they'll tell me things and then I'll print it up as a story. And of course, it's in black and white, whether it's on screen or whatever. And people therefore regard it as being true. Fake news is actually making stuff up. I mean, it's easy to say that anything that paints me in a bad light is fake news. It might very well not be fake news, but it's critical. The critical thinking part is the most important part of journalism and the media generally and it's not applied it's often not been applied it's been a problem throughout reporting of all sorts of things after all history is written by the winners yeah. for a start so you know do, can you trust them but journalism the media outlets especially the mainstream media are going through a hard time they're cutting back on staff the staff they have in house are given more and more work to do to make up for the lack of staff and therefore they are turning through you know gone are the days when every journalist could have a day to write a story you know you have a few who can do the investigation of journalism and spend days, weeks, whatever. But most of them are just jobbing journalists and they're basically not even reporting necessarily. They just sort of either they want to be a columnist and just don't bother researching and just you know, use their own opinion or they have they just repeat whatever someone else says. I've seen press releases published in daily newspapers with a journalist byline on it. So this story by this journalist, they might change a couple of words in the first paragraph and the rest is the press release because I've received the same press release. And when you see that... Especially I've by, seen that too, actually, yeah. Yeah, when you see it by named and noted journalists, 
not just hack, you know, journalist number 55 on the list, when you see it by some of the top-ranked journalists. A particular example I can think of from years ago, I'm talking about 40 years ago, I'm old enough to remember 40 years ago, it is very depressing to see it, but it's there, so it's not nothing particularly new. Is it more prevalent today? Mm, possibly because the journalists in the mainstream media are under pressure, and the ones who were the amateur solo journalists who are writing their blogs and things are after clickbait, as you have mentioned before. So, I mean, it's, um, if they are trying to get clicks or, you know, sort of page views and that sort of stuff and the newspapers are trying to sell newspapers so are they doing it more than before? It, it, it is certainly highlighted more than before. Whether they're doing it more than before is a different issue. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with StuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetime with stuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 